Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Aparuta de sangamata satawara e sodavanta bamunchantu satang. So, this is the uh, last evening of this retreat. Tomorrow is the last day. Then at tea time, I assumed you were given permission to break noble silence. So you can see the effect of a week's silence and then breaking the silence and now what is the what is the reality of now? Now. So I was referring back to the here and now. So they, when, since the, the time, the place, the conventions change accordingly, like tomorrow, you take the five precepts, you return to your homes, and so forth, that the times change, the situations change, but it's always now. So this is something to to keep in mind because with meditation, you the the idea is always doing something now for the future. Enlightenment in the future. The next meditation retreat. Seeing the that what's happening now is some kind of, you know, if it isn't quiet and still and if it's demanding or complicated, confused, it's it's uh, disrupting my mindfulness and uh, can't meditate. <coughs> so if you, if you change the attitude, uh, this is very important, from the the personal time bound uh, attitudes <coughs> seeing the difference between the conventions of Buddhism and the real the reality and reality is always now whatever you're feeling like or whatever <coughs> the conditions might be So the conditions change and, uh, you know, they go from peace and quiet, harmony to uh, chaos, war, uh, or just uh, daily life, uh, just putting on your clothes, uh, eating breakfast, riding uh, riding in the underground, uh, climbing the steps shopping in the supermarket, whatever, just the activities, it's always now. Now this is to remind, you know, when you try to figure it out, because remember language is, is, uh, is, is what we call linear. It goes from one word to the next. So where mindfulness is always now, it's, let's say, an overused hackneyed word, holistic, <laughs> or one. And uh, thinking is, is, you know, I- the thinking process is for uh, division. And the diff- it's, it's, its sole purpose is to, to notice the differences between conditions. So, you know, when we're stuck in this 
dualistic structure of our mind, then we, then we always see separation, feel loneliness, disease, a loss, uh, fear, the f- fear, anxiety, worry. Because the that's the that's the conditioned realm, the thinking realm, <coughs> and so we you know we can always uh, if and that's what we generally regard as our reality. So then, awakened, the Buddha, the Buddha awakened, awaken here and now. Don't don't wait till next retreat to awaken. Then, awakeness is nothing special. It's not like, you know, like a, a million a suns uh, descending on you all at once. <laughs> you know, you, you know, like you think of uh, the old uh, flash cameras. You know, with those bulbs, and they they flash, and then you kind of blind your eyes. And that's what what we think maybe enlightenment is, you know, it's such a kind of <laughs> incredible atomic flash. But that's that's too much light, isn't it? It blinds you, it doesn't make you mindful. You, you just kind of withdraw. But but enlightenment then seen as is switching on the light to see. See if you if you if the light's too strong you can't see, it blinds you. But if it's if it's the right amount of light, then you can see. So mindfulness then is is awakening and seeing, or this is you know knowing. Doesn't necessarily mean seeing with the eye. But consciousness itself is light, isn't it? It's it's uh, the light is this. When we're when we're in consciousness, when we're just conscious, mindful with consciousness, then that is enlightenment. We see that's the right amount of light to see clearly, to discern. But if we, uh, but what we do is we get stuck in the, uh, filtering our consciousness with our distorted attachment. So uh, everything like looking in one of those mirrors in a in a fun house, you know, that goes all wavy, and you can look at yourself. Is you know, it is does look like like you in a way, but it you know it's totally distorted. That's generally what what the real world, what people call the real world. <laughs> It's crazy. Uh, recognize that society is crazy. It's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and we are influenced by a crazy society. And uh, therefore, uh, we can't expect much from it. <coughs> but... Uh, Trust the impulse or the aspiration that brings you to, uh, you know, that, that say arouses an interest in the Buddhism or brings you to Amravati or to meditation retreat centers or whatever. So that this is, you know, a longing. There's, there's also in us a, a, this intuitive sense. We aren't just, you know, isolated uh Entities in a universe, even though sometimes you might feel like that. But there is, you know, we're, we're actually one, so that oneness can only be recognized through awareness, because that's that's ekagata or one pointedness. So we say ekagata is a Pali word means one so it's 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 a it's consciousness undivided uninterrupted with with uh, delusions 
attachment to delusion. So, so consciousness itself is has this expansive, uh, infinite. You know, it's unlimited. So, it receives everything. So that's where, by recognizing pure consciousness, then then the then the different conditions come and go accordingly. But some are sensible, reasonable, beautiful, kind, generous, good, and others are mediocre. Others are terrible, evil, foul, disgusting, <laughs> crazy, mad, maniacal, but the conditions that there's room for it all in in consciousness so once you recognize what you call your real home is that then then the conditions are just you know they're, they're not a problem because you see them uh, in terms of uh, through wisdom rather than through identity so the wisdom is all conditions are impermanent and uh, all Dhamma is is non-self. So then the, this oneness then use the, use this this in, this English word one. Then we have the Latin derivatives like uni, united or universe, unity, union, and these words. Uh, imply, you know, oneness. The universe is one. United Nations. That's an aspiration of the United Nations. But, you know, it's... it's uh, but nations like to keep their own identities and have their own views. So, it's... it's un- United... United is uh, is more of an aspiration. Now we're not aspiring towards some ideal anymore, but realizing it. The reality is this: it's no longer an ideal we aspire to. If we just think about it, if we're just caught in the thinking process, then we, then we aspire or we long for oneness or unity or union or enlightenment or nibbana, freedom. Uh, and that's the thinking mind. The longing, longing for something, is uh, is is created through thinking. So then the the way out of thinking is not through suppressing, but through recognizing. Awareness of thinking. So this sati sampachanya sati panya is uh, is your true nature. Ajahn Chah referred to it in a little booklet here uh, called "Our Real Home." You know, where is your real home? And of course, this is you know for those of us who are uh, you know like expatriates and or people that have wa- spent their lives going from one place to another <laughs> where do I belong you know where's my real home and then you know you think of it is uh, you know there's uh, certain good aspects of every place I've lived in and certain negative ones and and yet even in the birthplace of that I don't feel it's my real home well people are always looking for you know a place where they feel at ease where they where they no longer feel like a stranger or a foreigner or an alien and the only the only possibility for that is is awareness because that is your real home the, the others are just, uh, you know, maybe attachments, maybe, you know, they're conditioned. You know, born in in the United States, so you're told you're an American. But my real home isn't that, is it? Because 
real home doesn't depend on is not nationality. Now oneness is also a word, so uh, this is this is a another you know, this is like a reflection, you know, taking these words and uh then probably the ekagata and, and that's tend to be one pointedness. So there's, uh, you know, I always, c- you know, I tended to see ekagata as you kind of focused on a point. Because it's one point. And a point always, in, in the way I used to look at a point, was, you know, a dot, like on a white, white surface, you know, and you put a dot there, and that's the point, and you and you focus all your attention on that black dot on the white background and and you, you don't bother with the white background you're just stuck into that little dot well you can't live like <laughs> in that state can you it, it's not very adaptable but so so then then taking one point, does the point need to be a dot, or, you know, a little dot, or maybe it's the whole thing? Oneness. So, you you know, this is fair enough. <laughs> Who's, who, who, who am I to define the point as, as this little dot on a black, on a white square, or oneness? Well, for practical, for living, you know, and breathing, and going to the toilet, and eating food, and shopping at the uh, at the uh, shopping mall, and whatever, is the the point has to be infinite. So, to to be truly one pointed, then is to open to the infinite. And the infinity uh, includes everything. It's not selective, doesn't prefer, you know, it's not critical. It receives everything fairly. Like the sun shines on everything, doesn't it? Shines on George Bush, <laughs> shines on Tony <laughs> Shines on Nelson Mandela. The same way too, isn't it? I mean, it's it doesn't say I'm going to only shine on the really good people in this world. <laughs> Shines on the piranha fish and the crocodile. <laughs> it shines <laughs> on serial killers, the same as it shines on me. Uh, it's, you know, this is this is uh, you know seeing the light. Uh, is it has no preferences. So in terms of, say, you know, the uh, in terms of direct experience from this point here, from this incarnation in this form, say, taking the metaphor of the sun, then the, that is consciousness itself, isn't it? So, because that 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 receives everything, it's non-selective. So this is, and and when you truly uh, recognize and value and appreciate mindfulness, then then you learn from everything, because all conditions, whether it's the good or the bad, right or wrong, are what they are, you know, and they're Conditions uh, change. They're anicca, sukhanata. So this is, they're always teaching us this. You know, no matter what, what quality the condition may be. So that's why the more you recognize awareness, mindfulness, and uh, satipanya, then this, this is a, uh, you know, you're discerning the conditions, but you're not, you're not caught in the power of their qualities anymore. 
you're not you're not deluded and hooked by them and and born into them endlessly reborn over and over again in love and hate and like and dislike and and so forth your your true nature is the deathless so the gate to the deathless is open That's a pronouncement, you know. So that it says, you know, that now that always meant a lot to me because uh, maybe I'm that kind of person. I like pronouncements. I li- <laughs> I like the fact that some, you know, the, somebody like the Buddha stated this. You know, for me. 2,550 years ago seems a very long time. In according to the history of the universe, it's not. It's not a very long time. But in terms of our human way of thinking, uh, you know, that seems ancient, you know. Ancient India. But it's not really that long ago, is it? 2,500. But even 1950 now seems pretty ancient. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're when you're my age, you kind of forget the younger generations don't have the same perceptions. You know, like for me, Second World War and all these things, are, and the the kind of film stars and politicians in the 40s and 50s, and I talk about these to the monks and never heard of them before. (laughs) And I realize I'm kind of like, you know, for them a Neanderthal man. (laughs) (laughs) Now this this reflectiveness, uh, I use this word reflection because in, like in the Four Noble Truths, if you notice the, like each Noble Truth has three aspects. So, and this is, this is like, in, so it has the, the statement, like there is suffering. So it has what they call a bariati, or a kind of uh, intellectual statement of the problem. There is dukkha. That's the first aspect of each noble truth. First aspect of each noble truth is a statement. There is suffering, suffering. Then the second noble truth, the bariati dhamma side of it is there is a cause, the rising of suffering, there's the origin of suffering. Third noble truth, there is cessation of suffering. Fourth noble truth, there is the path uh, of non-suffering or the eightfold path so it's there is now this is a this is this puts the the intellect there's a statement the words then the second aspect of each of the four noble truths is uh, is what to do about it it's prescription so it states the makes the statement and then tells you what to do so there is suffering and then the second is suffering should be understood. So the second aspect of each of the Four Noble Truths is always about should. And this is called Bhatibhata. Bhatibhata. So this in, in Thai, Thailand, they use the word Bhatibhat is for meditation. Like Ajahn Chah at the Wat this is this is a Bhatibhat monastery. Because in a lot of the <coughs> monasteries in Thailand are Bariat monasteries. Now, a Bariat monastery, and they say this in Thai, is where the monks study like the Buddhist colleges, and they study Pali, and they study the Abhidhamma, and they study the scriptures. And now in Buddhist universe, they're studying modern psychology and 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 uh, what is it? IT, 
or <laughs> many things. So monasticism is, I don't know what's going to happen to it. If <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of the tradition, the, um, you know, the, the, the Bariati monks, you know, are ones who, 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 who are the scholars, the academics. And so they, they study the scriptures, the Pali language, Sanskrit language, and so anything on the studying side, intellectual side. And, and then uh, the for Thai first tradition is a Bhattibhat tradition, Bhattibhata, which is like practice, practicing the meditation, or the practicing the teaching. Now you can keep that division, you know, say, you know, you can get, you can be a snob, like a butty butt snob. <laughs> we aren't like those Bariat monks, they only study the scriptures, they don't know what they're really, they're not putting into practice. We're butty butt monks, in the sense that we're, the, we're better than they are. <laughs> so, I mean, any, any attachment always creates this, this sense of more division, doesn't it? it you know, you, you belong, you were keeping strict, we're trained with strict vinya rules. We keep to the exact letter of the traditional vinaya, but those monks don't. We're better than they are. And this is, this is attachment, so you're attaching to good things, but it makes you a snob, arrogant, conceited. You see, so the, the danger is always in, in, on, in this dualistic realm is the critical faculties take us over. Because, uh, you know, in terms of right and wrong, good and bad, it has a true, true but not right, right but not true quality. So, in, in, in this, uh, this, is, this is where the reflectiveness is necessary. Like, if, if we're just practicing, butty bot monks, you know, practicing and with the idea that it makes us better than the Bariat monks, and we and that's what we do. We're never going to. We aren't really any better than they are. We're just as deluded, actually, because uh, you know we're coming from conceit and uh, and attachment to to an ideal or an idea. Now this is uh, so. Say the. For the second aspect of the First Noble Truth, suffering should be understood. The second aspect of the Second Noble Truth, the causes of suffering, which is attachment to the three kinds of desire, should be let go of. So the, the prescription, the practice is letting go. So understanding, should understand suffering, let go of the causes. The the second aspect of the third noble truth, there is the cessation and the aspect, the practice is should be realized. So notice that this relationship of letting go and reali realization. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, at first, you know, you don't, it takes a while to, to, to recognize the kind of genius of his teaching. Where well, it's a statement, and to to understand is to admit something, recognize it, you know, see it. This like this suffering is like this. There is this suffering. It's no longer kind of talking about the suffering of the Holocaust or of you know the Native Americans or the suffering of the Australian Aborigines. We're talking about this. <laughs> So, so then, this this re, uh, you know letting go by letting go of conditioned phenomena, then we we the cessation takes place. We 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 don't see cessation of conditioned phenomena usually. We don't notice it. It's doing it all the time, but we 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 are always you know the the deluded mind is always when something starts ceasing or we, we go on we seek an, a rebirth so in terms of of rebirth you know we're being reborn all the time 
soon as life gets a little boring, we we seek to we we distract ourselves into something else. Reading the book, getting bored, going to the fridge. It's a rebirth. You know, you 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 aren't waiting to just see through the boredom of what you're doing because the the interest in it isn't there anymore so you just feel it's which is a, a you know isn't a pleasant feeling you know we don't like to be bored because boredom is boring <laughs> and we like the feeling of of arising you know like the the idea of tasting uh, you know having something from the fridge uh, you know, eating something is, has, is uh, you know, that if you eat too much, you get bored with eating. And so, you know, whatever you do on the conditioned realm, you, you reach a peak, and, and even the most pleasant things uh, get boring. Like there's too much excitement is boring. You know, if you live a really, you know, uh, machine gun fire exciting life <laughs> you know you just you you end up you know you burn out you, so that there's a uh, you know just one exciting thing after another and you get bored with being excited so in in many t- that's why the, in this, this style is to be mindful of this of this rising ceasing and then you the letting then the insights of letting go and realizing non attachment. When you let go of conditions then their nature is to cease and you, you realize cessation. So it's not you know, so this cessation isn't a annihilation. No, when when cessation in terms of how I experience cessation is Sound of silence. Everything ceases in the sound of silence. So cultivating that sound of silence is a, has been my major practice for many years now. Because at first it's you know the the other the desire the habits are are strong and. It's so easy to, you know, in moments to kind of recognize it and then be whirled away with all the urgency, urgent problems and crises of the Sangha life in England. (laughs) (laughs) So even Buddhist monasteries can be, you know, endless, one crisis after another. you know that's the way the world is. It's you know you don't you don't get out of it by ordaining by becoming a monk or a nun. Uh, because you know you know everything that happens to us is you know on a personal level it, it you know it's things that to you might not seem of any great significance can be you know a crisis for us. <laughs> 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 so on the condition plane there's no hope you know you, to try to perfect monastic life as an end in itself you're going to be disappointed because it you know if you don't it's it's a tool to use it's not an end in itself so then realizing realizing cessation is this and it's real you know it's this I like this word realization because it and then they, in Thai they use the word tam hai jang which means make it you know make it clear you know real it's real reality don't just it's not just a, a fragmentary kind of thing that that depends on conditions supporting it like refined samadhi depends on conditions. You know, it doesn't integrate into uh, the the shopping mall experience. 
It's hard to sustain Fourth of John in the shopping mall. <laughs> <coughs> but in but in terms of cessation, it's you know as you recognize it, it it allows you to be fully present and and aware of uh, you know where you are and what what the you know you're not just kind of wandering in a trance around a shopping mall, but you maybe you're going there to get something. I mean, it's, it gives you, it, you know, it gives you, it's, you, you know what you're doing, in other words, uh, on a practical level, and just daily life, and, and uh, work, and relationships. Then, uh, then, the, then the second aspect of the Fourth Noble Truth, which is, uh, there is this eightfold path, or this based on right understanding, samaditi. Or this is actually the way of non-suffering, fourth noble truth. The first noble truth, there is suffering. Fourth noble truth is the is the way of non-suffering, and this is to be developed. And the word for this is pawana. Now in the Thai language they use pavana for meditation. That's the word. They, they say, uh, uh, you know, pavana, bati bat. These kind of words they use for what we generally the uh, English word meditation. <coughs> so pavana is really developing awareness. Because so awareness isn't a creation, so it's it's it, it's not something that you create, but you you integrate, you 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 recognize and develop this this awareness because you, and that takes a, a kind of surrendering, uh, you know, it, 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 all these the ambition of a self of greed and. And all your prejudices and resentments and views and opinions on a worldly level, if you bind yourself to them, you're always stuck into into greed, hatred, and delusion, and all the suffering that comes from that. But as you let go, I see the the true nature of conditioned phenomena as unsatisfactory. You're not attacking it or annihilating it, but you're just letting it be what it is. Then you, you're, and that you do with satipanya, awareness and wisdom. So it's like connected mindfulness. Your mindfulness, it has this, like the flow, like the sound of silence, like sound of a stream. It, it, it has, you know, it has no beginning, no end. It doesn't, it it it's not intrusive. It doesn't kind of cancel out everything. It's like space. It it everything belongs. Everything is is highlighted. Is is recognized more clearly once you have that perspective. Like the sound of silence, you can like the my as I've said before, listening to the sound of a stream or or a, a waterfall. It makes the sound of silence is there too, and you can very recognizable, but it, it isn't kind of overpowering the sound of the stream. Or you can hear it behind music. You know, so you, if you listen to music, you can also, at the same moment, be aware of the sound of silence. It doesn't, you know, uh, smother the sound of the music at all. So what is it? You know, is, is uh, just, uh, you know, one wants a name for it or scriptural reference. So I am, uh, you know, kind of unique Buddhist monk because nobody else teaches like this, by the way. So... <laughs> So maybe I'm, I've got it wrong. <laughs> so you have to find out for yourself. <laughs> uh, 
I'm just sharing what I've learned and not not coming on as a kind of authority uh, of uh, you know Buddha Dhamma. But but this you have is you realize for yourself what is freedom, what is non suffering and what is suffering. And that's discerning, isn't it? Then now this is now this this pattern of the four nobles is the three aspects. The third aspect of each noble truth is what they call bhati-veti. That is, bhariyati, bhati-bhati, bhati-veti. Bhati-veti is the there is, uh, suffering has been understood. So it's a it's a reflection, you know. You 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 do do what they say, and then you you have the result of that. So the first noble truth: there is suffering. Suffering should be understood. Suffering has been understood. So it's the result result of the practice of the bhati bhati. So th- and this is what this is a ref- a reflective pattern, you know, uh, that the Buddha is teaching. It's not doctrinal, in other words. That you don't start from metaphysical doctrine. That and then you, your logic and your experience all are deducted from a metaphysical doctrine. You know, so so you start. What the Buddha is genius was to start from an existential uh, experience that all human beings have, which is dukkha. So it's uh, you know this is it's starting from something very ordinary that we all have and uh, you know it's it's so it's it's nothing special it's not a special kind of dukkha <laughs> it's just feeling ill at ease or uncomfortable or lonely or whatever so you know, so it includes a whole range of of uh, of suffering but um you know suffering's too much you know for people that are Tortured and and uh, brutalized and humiliated and that you know the, maybe the suffering is too much to get any perspective. All you want to do is is uh, kill your the the people that are doing it to you. You know, so you just create more anger and and that. But say in uh, you know for one thing with. In, you know, if you have too much happiness, if you're too privileged, you tend to get very complacent. You know, so you meet people who who are very fortunate in, you know, having lots of money and ease and all the advantages of the best and oftentimes very complacent. No, no, we don't suffer. We, life is just a banquet, you know. I love it. It's just wonderful. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm going to go have lunch at the Ritz. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like that. Just one pleasurable, fascinating life. You know, this is what we dream of, isn't it? In, in when we're young, is just having a really wonderful life full of interesting friends and adventures and experiences. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, then the, the suffering, the dukkha, is what what uh, awakens us. You see, so that like the, the in the traditional story of uh, the life of the Buddha, Prince Siddhartha was brought up in. Uh, in this privileged way, you know, and the story goes, the, you know, the king Suddhodana and his father, when they, when the astrologist at the birth of Prince Siddhartha predicted he'd either be a, a world emperor or a Buddha, and then like most fathers, <laughs> want us to be world emperors, not Buddhists. You know. I don't want my son to be a Buddha. 
<laughs> None of our fathers wanted us to be Buddhist monks. <laughs> They'd prefer if we became prime ministers. Or <laughs> you know, something important. You can say, my son is the prime minister. Say, my son is a Buddhist monk. And everybody looks at, oh. <laughs> That must be very difficult for you to bear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then King Suddhodana thought, well, I'll make sure that he doesn't become a Buddha. So, you know, he tried to, you know, the story goes, this is legend, that he arranged the life of Prince Siddhartha to, to not stimulate anything that would make him question you know, take away all the signs that awaken you, all the the messengers that, that might make you wonder about life and just, you know, present only the very best. So, so you know, all old people were forbidden to, you know, they no longer allowed in the palace and, and sick and sickness, sick people couldn't, if you were sick, you probably had to, to go outside. And and uh, if you were, you know, and, and it died, you that was just you know, that was uh, unacceptable even suggested. <laughs> <laughs> so old age, sickness, and death—they're the—they're the signs, aren't they, of uh, that awaken us. So then the uh, Prince Siddhartha, you know, like, you know, he he had, you know, nice life, beautiful wife, baby, everything. You know, he had all the privileges, good education. Uh, he was, you know, super, he was, he was first boy in the class. He was... <laughs> <laughs> He was valedictorian. He was summa cum laude. He was the best. <clears throat> and then, when he kind of, you know, without the king knowing what he's doing, he kind of, uh, one, one day, kind of, went outside the palace and, and was shocked by the, an old man, a sick, sick person, and a corpse. And then the fourth messenger was a monk or a samana. Well, these are called the four heavenly messengers. Deva Dutta, they're called. And uh, Deva is a, is, is a heavenly being, you know. Deva Dutta, messenger, heavenly messengers. So what's heavenly about a corpse? <coughs> you know, this is, you know, it's something you you get rid of as quickly as possible. But it is a corpse, the human corpse especially, is a very <laughs> powerful experience. It is, it does make you, you know, when you see one, it, it does, you know, it's a strong uh, impingement because you're seeing what happened. You know, it's telling, this is a teacher, it's a messenger. A corpse or sickness is a messenger. And old age is is a messenger. These are the warning signs that that awaken us, that make us question: What is the purpose of life? What is it just to have you know just have a privileged life with all laughs and fun? Or is you know so much of life you know you can kind of if you can keep that illusion going, but it's it's hard to sustain that illusion. It takes a lot of effort to sustain your delusions that life is wonderful and and it's all just fun and games, pleasure one one romance after another, one exciting event, one. So then, you know, try to sustain romantic love. You know, it, it, you know, it's in, it's in the Cinderella story, but in, in real life, it doesn't work like that. You've got to have that in the beginning to want to get married.
of some kind of, you know, inspired feeling, some kind of uplifting experience. But it's unsustainable because that's the nature of conditioned phenomena, arising and ceasing. So then the, the samana, the shaven-headed samana in the robe, is also a messenger. So that's why what I see also in like living here in the in the UK as a Buddhist monk, I see myself as a kind of th- fulfilling the the role as a Devaduta, just my appearance. This is one way of justifying your existence. <laughs> But it does. It does. It has, it, it has a effect on people, you know. So it, you know, <coughs> whether they know what you are or anything, but it does uh, arouse. You know, it can Many people have told me that they, just by seeing this, this uh, something in them, you know, kind of awakened or something opened in them that wasn't there before. So this is, you know, this is the this is the other side of the. This is like the exhalation, isn't it? Old age, sickness, death, and then the then the monastic or the samana is is a human being who who is, uh, you know, uh, rec- realizing the deathless, ideally. So maybe this is an archetypal form. That's why you hesitate to change it too much. I've often admired the Korean bhikkhus with their robes, or they wear these nice kind of trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have this. This is a very difficult thing to wear, actually. That's Samanera Adijo, who's newly ordained. Takes a long time to, and even after 40 years, it, this thing rolls off. And <laughs> thing, you know. so it's not exactly, you know, a practical garment or easy to wear. Well, these are these are the conventions we have, and. And and we all experience old age and sickness, and we're all going to die, and so that that's why you're here, isn't it? Something in you is longing for some for for oneness or union, or non-suffering, or to be feel at home, to be at ease, uh, or it may you know how you want to express it can be quite individual, but but. Uh, that, that sense of of finding, you know, the the one that was made for you. You know, the the, the romantic stories of the of the prince uh, uh, finding, you know, Cinderella, in, in, you know, as a <coughs> as a metaphor for union, perfect union. <coughs> so those are fairy tales, and those are metaphors and they have limit they're, they're limited by that but the actual realization is not a metaphor not a fairy tale uh, and so this is this is like awakening to reality or buddha knowing the dhamma like this pure state, natural state of consciousness informed with wisdom, the Buddha recognizing the way it is. And and so within the, the mortal form that we're now experiencing, the bodies that we have, then the, this is a mortal form, it, it will die. Then, uh, so it's a very limited form, uh, and then it gets old and gets sick. It has various, uh, you know, and then people have disabilities and 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 all kinds of, you know, body offers infinite opportunities for misery. 
and think, because it is, you know, like some people I know are are, are uh, caught in a in a really l- horrible body that like being in a torture chamber all the time. Fortunately, this body has been a fairly good one <laughs> so far. Hasn't created too many problems, but some people I know, you know, have chronic pain. You know, it never lets up. Now, now when I I don't have chronic pain, but when I have some pain, that's bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> but to have it all the time, you know, God, terrible. But you know, these these things are, if it, you know, people, some people will then have these disabilities or or chronic pain or uh, you know physical, you know, ongoing, relentless physical problems, they, sometimes they, they're more fortunate than the healthy ones because if they use a problem, they're kind of forced to use mindfulness. The only way to deal with chronic pain is to be mindful. Otherwise you become addicted to morphine or something. You know, if you just want to get rid of the pain, uh, or, or make it less, you have to take usually the morphine, the kind of narcotics. And so, but if, but they're teaching, you know, like pain control and pain management. This John Kevin Zinn came here last year. He's a famous in the States uh, on working in hospitals to, uh, through meditation, teaching. Uh, you know, mindfulness practices to deal with with people suffering from chronic pain. He's become very a kind of an authority on it in the United States. So, you know, and this is uh, this is you know this is the the way of 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 dealing with 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 just physical pain, unrelenting pain. Is not through trying to, you know, make it go away because uh, because you don't like it, but by using the pain in a in a skillful way. So it's like using the dukkha you have, the suffering, whatever it is, if it's physical or or emotional, or the the kind of personality or character or situations, it's, it's taking dukkha, this suffering, and using this dukkha to re- realize non-suffering. So it doesn't mean that somebody with chronic pain doesn't feel pain, but they don't create suffering. Now there's a, there's a difference, isn't there? Like, like, a, like a pain, you get some pain in your, in your body, and then you then you you t- want to get rid of it. At least I do. <laughs> you know, it's, I find you know wanting to get rid of it as soon as possible. I don't like physical pain. And uh, and uh, and when it and if I can get rid of it quickly, I do it. And I do whatever it is to get rid of it because I don't like it and don't want it. <coughs> then, like in meditation here, that when you're having to sit for a long time, the body starts producing d- all kinds of aches, pains, and discomforts. And and then we want to, you know, you can see this aversion arising to, to the uh, physical sensation. Now, usually we don't discriminate between. We, we think, we, because, uh, uh, you know, we don't know any better. We think uh, pain is the cause of my suffering. This pain in my leg is is the cause. If I can get rid of this pain, then I'll, then I won't suffer. But in 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 exploring physical pain, you begin to notice the actual se- sensation and the aversion that you have to it. Now this is discerning, isn't it? Discerning the difference. There's there is this sensation we call pain. I didn't create the pain. It's, you know, that happens. But I create the aversion to it. 
Wipa Wadanha. I don't want it, I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. Now that I mean you begin to observe, that's what that's what you create onto the sens- sensation. So you're beginning to develop this wisdom, this discernment of, you know, what is the way it is and what you create out of ignorance. Now when you see that, then you, you begin to, you know, realize that that just hating, resisting, controlling, uh, wanting to get rid of what you don't like, resenting and so forth that that this is what you're creating onto the present moment when you see you don't have to do that because your discerning abilities are developing the panya faculty is operating <coughs> well panya means you you see the difference so you don't create suffering or if you are creating suffering you you realize to let go stop Stop doing it. Stop creating suffering. Because, you know, if you don't know the difference, you, you're just caught in the habit. You're just, you know, that's the way, you know, pain comes. I hate it. Get rid of it. Uh, and and then, you know, you can take drugs or do whatever, you know, uh, to try to get rid of the pain. But then... <coughs> You know, I'm not saying not to do anything about it. But see also, I mean, if you're not suffering from chronic pain, but you, the kind of pains that you have from from meditation retreat, they're, they're important to study, to, to investigate. To be able to discern the difference between the actual sensation, which is natural to the, bo- the body's sensitive form, So when you sit a long time, it feels like this. Pain starts, or um, uncomfortable sensation. That's, you don't create that out of ignorance. That's the nature of this realm, you know, is the sensitive realm. So then the, then the aversion, you know, get rid of it. Uh, so that's the, like, Vipavadanha, the three kinds of desire in the in the second noble truth: sensual desi- desire for sense pleasure, desire for becoming, desire for annihilation. So the desire to annihilate the pain, isn't it? And that's mixed with the you know you just, out of just reactivity and ignorance. You don't you don't you just react. You get caught in reaction, and you don't. You know, so you're not developing wisdom. You're just reacting to, uh, to to an unpleasant sensation. But as you as you use the suffering and th- investigate it, then you then you see the difference between the the way it is, what's natural at this time, the way it is at this here and now and what you create out of ignorance, out of habit. So then then the path is very clear, developing or cultivating awareness. There's a, the way of mindfulness, path to the deathless. Appamado amatabang, heedfulness is the way to the deathless. Then uh, in that Dhammapada verse, Apamado Amatapadang, um, heedfulness, being atten- paying attention, being aware, is the way to the Amatapadang, the deathless. Apamado uh, Machunopadang is the second verse. Pamado is heedless, being heedless, not paying attention, being just caught in reactions, is the way to death. Now uh, notice that there's a, the way to the deathless and the way to death. And most most human beings are practicing the way to death. <laughs> In the Pamado Machunopadang. So this is the you know, the 
Ignorance means that we have aligned ourselves with death. We're clinging to death. And then we wonder why we're so, you know, frightening. Because you're trying to, you, you know, I don't want to die. Uh, death is frightening. And and then you try to, well, better, that's not politically acceptable, you know, socially, talk, even say the word death. In, or, you know, talk about contemplating corpses. <laughs> when we first came here to Amravati, you know, one of the ideas was to have a crematorium here, you know, where we could have Buddhist funerals and cremate the bodies. And when the local people found out, they went absolutely crazy. <laughs> Burning corpses here <laughs> in Great Gaddesden. And freaked them out totally. <laughs> so we, we gave that plan up. <laughs> because death is, you know, is it's not nice to talk about. And you don't go to a party where everybody's having a good time to talk about death, do you? <laughs> or they won't never invite you back. <laughs> so, I encourage you to this, this, uh, this, uh, explore the teaching, you know. So what I've said during this retreat is, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, just hearing what I know and, and encouraging you to find out, you know. So how to use these, this particular teaching is not a doctrine. So I can't say, you know, you have to do it like I do and believe what I say. Otherwise, you, you're a heretic not the way of the Buddha at all. But it, it is a, uh, you know, an encouragement, invitation uh, to awaken and, and find out. And these, these Dhamma teachings of the Buddha are really skillful means for that kind of endeavor. <laughs>